Hi, everyone. I'm Pat Finnegan, also known as Vax or Vax11. Um, I actually helped start the Vintage Computer Festival in Midwest um, 10, 12, 14, 15 years ago, something like that, um, down in West Lafayette, Indiana, handed it off to the group that's running it now in Chicago. Um, as my handle sort of suggests, I usually collect things like Vaxes, but uh, I'm going to talk about something a little different, something a little more personal to me, actually, um, televideo systems. Um, so I've been, so basically what I'm going to talk about in this talk um, is a little bit of homebrew and a little bit of repair systems. Um, so what I've done for the course, over the, mostly I've been collecting all of this over the course of the last year. Uh, sort of been reinvigorated by last year's VCF Midwest. Um, and sort of gotten back into looking for televideo systems. Um, why televideo? Televideo is sort of, there's me in front of a televideo system at my, uh, let's see, I think that was fifth grade, uh, sort of Invent America it was called at the time. Um, so I have a little bit of personal involvement. Um, that televideo portable computer was what I had growing up. Uh, my dad was an optometrist. He, his office had a distributed system. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But televideo systems there that I got involved with. Um, televideo stuff seems to be pretty cheap when you can find it. Um, finding it is really the hard part at this point. Um, they weren't really love machines because they were mostly did back office. Um, there's a lot of use in small healthcare or legal offices just doing word processing and sort of client database type functions. Um, the hardware seems to be cheaply made and is sort of unreliable. I found lots of semi-broken machines, that have, but they've been pretty repairable. So pretty much commodity parts. Um, there's some custom parts in the machines, but they haven't seemed to fail a whole lot. They're completely the opposite end of the spectrum from IBM and DEC. IBM and DEC, of course, made generally big machines, big mainframes, doing whole companies. Um, they were expensive. Televideo sort of prided themselves on uh, price leaders. And of course, being price leaders means that you can't spend a whole lot of money to make stuff work. They also didn't do a whole lot of marketing, so not a whole lot of people really remember them, it seems like, these days. Um, so, who is Televideo? The, so, they started out making, actually, monitors for arcade machines, which is how they got the name Televideo. Most of their products have nothing to do with television or video. <laughs> so, the name's a little out there, but um, after they did that, they sort of progressed into ter making terminals. They had a good monitor, sort of video system business. Um, they saw... Lear Sigler and DEC making terminals, they decided, eh, why not get into this? Um, so they made terminals that were sort of clones of what DEC and Lear Sigler made. There's a Dell Video 925. 950 looks pretty similar. Um, and they look almost exactly like a VT100. Um, so some of their initial products looked very much like they didn't hire anyone to help them design their products. They just copied whatever they could. Um, from there, they went on to doing sort of distributed systems um, and sort of small CPM machines. These were all CPM based. They were, it wasn't MPM, so it's not multi-user on one machine. You'd have one sort of central file and resource server that could do, you could share things like printers and um, shared file system, so you could run databases sort of natively against it. Um, there was the 801 and 806 introduced in like 1981. Um, so if you're familiar with CPM, that was really late in the game for introducing CPM machines. Um, but at that point, they could produce pretty cheap integrated machines with pretty full resources. So you'd get a couple floppy drives. You had an option for a hard drive internal in the machine. A um, couple serial ports, 64K RAM was standard, the minimum amount they would sell you. Um, so you could run just about any soft CPM software you wanted to on it. Um, then they introduced some more cost-reduced machines. Um, the 
802 and 803, which I don't have a picture, actually. So the 803 is the bottom machine in that picture right there. Um, so it could actually do some amount of graphics. They call it business graphics. Basically meant monochrome. You had a resolution sort of similar to high resolution CJ, which would get you two colors and uh, 640 by 240 on this. Um, sort of a strange aspect ratio, but you could do pie charts, you could do bar charts, and it was not too bad to look at to read text. Um, after that, they sort of moved into 16-bit machines, so they started out with 16-bit CPM machines. That was using an 8088, um, sort of a direct upgrade of the 802 and 803, um, running newer version CPM. There's some strangeness trying to get those to work with the older 8-bit CPM stuff. So they actually supported both of those in the same environment with the same server. Um, runs, so you had different binaries you had to run across both. Um, then they realized IBM was really winning the day. They moved into MS-DOS compatible machines. So the machine I had in the picture looked a whole lot like this machine, which is actually 8-bit. But it's a, this is a TPC-1. The machine I had was a TPC-2, which was the PC version of this. Um, externally, it looks exactly the same except the badge. This even has 10 function keys, an XT layout keyboard. You hit Control Delete to reset it. It's a little, a little strange for CPM, but um, they did a lot of sharing of components between machines too. So you'll see the same keyboard in between a few different types of machines. The, the terminals like the 925 and the 802 uh, desktop actually use the same keyboard with a different badge on it. Um, they moved on from that. They made some newer systems, personal mini. They ventured. And at that point, they sort of faltered. They couldn't really keep up with the price wars that were happening um, from all the Asian PC makers and all the discount PC makers at that point. Um, they sort of went back into thin clients. Um, what they made ended up being bought out by Boundless Technologies and then HP. So you can still, if you get an HP thin client, there's still a little bit of televideo in there. Now, over the past year, like I mentioned, I've been trying to refine televideo systems. First time I went looking, which was probably 10, 15 years ago, there was nothing on eBay. Um, I was lucky to get a couple of machines that I got from, actually, at the first Vintage Computer Festival that I ran. Uh, some guy had a couple 801s in his basement, which he gave me. Let's see, I have a little bit of family tree here. 801 is this machine on the bottom left. Uh, 816 is the next machine I got from, if anyone remembers, Don Maslin, rest in peace. Um, he, he gave me his old 816, so that was one of the distributed servers. Unfortunately, the tape drive was bad and the hard drive was crashed by the time I got it. Um, so I couldn't, I didn't really have software for it. Um, it also has some internal faults. It doesn't always like to turn on. Uh, power supply capacitors are part of that problem and just a few, a few faults I haven't quite figured out yet. Um, so I started collecting machines and just watching eBay, I've actually found that there's been quite a bit more people trying to dump these machines lately. So I got a couple 803s. That guy at 802 is this guy up here. Um, the TPC-1 that, you, that I showed you. Um, some MS-DOS compatible, so just look exactly like the 803, but they have a PC XT equivalent inside. Um, 256K of RAM, an expansion card slot that they shoehorned in there. A couple floppy drives. Um, and finally, just a couple of weeks ago, I finally got my TPC2 again. It's still not working and still not quite together, which so I wasn't able to bring it. But I finally found the computer that my parents had thrown out 20 years ago in a slightly more working version. Oh, so the reason that I don't have any of these machines for my youth is they all failed. 
Um, so the hardware was, as I mentioned, sort of cheap. They had a single PCB. They're sort of late to the game with, um, with CPM. You can sort of see the integration. This is the 803 that I have. Motherboard is, has a floppy controller. It has a video controller. It has all of the memory. It has spots for an extra 64K of RAM, which is bank switched, uh, a bunch of serial ports. It has a spot you can plug a uh, hard drive controller into, which is this guy here, and an optional RS-422 interface. So RS-422 was the basic interface that they used to do the distributed system. They ran SDLC, also called HDLC now, if anyone's familiar with that, using Zilog Z8530 chips. Um, actually, they're they're SIO2s, I guess, at that point. But um, So they use that to make a network. The network ran at about 800 kilobits per second, which was not too bad for 1981. Pretty, pretty quick network. The slow part, obviously, was the hard drive, the 10 to 40 meg hard drive in the server. Um, so one of the op so they did have a few options. The hard drive controller was optional, so that was an expensive option. The RS-422 controller in this was optional because you could actually get this, instead of that controller, you could get a multi-serial port controller. And you could actually have an NPM system, um, which they produced for a short amount of time. But again, the machine looked almost exactly the same. Um, faults. There's been a few consistent faults that I've noticed. Um, floppy drives are always getting dirty or have, they sort of, they use the same sort of shoe drives that everyone used at the time, including the PC and the Apple II. It seems like the, f the latch on the front likes to break, um, likes to get dirty. The analog boards sort of start, start to die. Um, the floppy data separator chip likes to die on these. Um, I think it's bipolar instead of CMOS, and it overheats. The design, so this is sitting in a machine. This is actually vertical. There's no fans in this machine. They call it an innovative cooling tower design because they took out the fans they had in earlier machines, which actually means that the, over time, some of the chips overheat. Um, so the floppy chip, the system RAM tended to overheat. The video RAM tended to overheat. Um, and going back to the original machines, it seemed a little bit rushed out the door. The two 801s that I have actually have different sets of fly wiring on the motherboard. One works, one doesn't. I'm not sure either one worked originally. Um, I've fix some of the fly wiring to make it look like the, more like the 802 schematics that I could actually find. So a lot of the documentation I've been able to find, 801 I haven't, I don't think, I'm not sure it exists just because it looks like it, the machine was sold for about three months before the 802 came out. The 802 with the built-in terminal, um, so the 801 was just a system you add a terminal to. It was cheaper to get the machine with the built-in terminal. Um, so integration really saved them a lot of money. Um, hard drives. They notoriously had a problem with the hard drives in the 806 sort of servers that they shipped. Um, within a few months, most of them failed. They recalled them. At this point, I'd be surprised if any of them are actually still working. Uh, old drives just fail. I mean, it happens. Um, so what I've done. So the first sort of test project I did to get, back, get myself back into hardware design, I went through Purdue, got a computer engineering degree in 2004. Um, so I actually had worked on hardware and software design somewhat back then. Um, first thing I did was take an Arduino, reverse engineer the keyboard protocol, um, so they like to reuse things. The keyboard protocol is basically 9600 baud, 5 volt serial, 
um, TTL levels. And it sent a prefix byte, which told it what shift keys there were, and a data byte, which was an ASCII character. This ended up being pretty easy to figure out once I figured out what I was looking for. Um, and they used that same protocol through all the terminals and CPM machines that had detachable keyboards. Um, the main difference is, is some they used 5 volt power, some they used 12 volt power, some they swapped around some lines. Um, but all in all, this, this was a pretty good project to get started. I ended up with basically just a tiny Arduino, the cable coming off one end with a, a modular jack to plug into the terminal, PS2 connector on the other end. Um, I found this PS2 keyboard library for Arduino, which was a great starting place, but nowhere near complete enough to be usable. Um, it mostly assumed you're just sending ASCII characters to something, so it didn't track things like shift state. There's all these other extra keys on the keyboard, like next page and like insert character, which had no equivalent. So I had to remap a lot of things and all those gray keys on the keyboard, um, PC keyboard, I sort of tried to remap onto something that was useful for the terminal. Um, I got to use a oscilloscope, which was kind of fun. But now I can actually use an IBM Model M on, uh, that's a Televideo 965 terminal, so sort of mid 80s, late 80s um, terminal design that they had. Terminals are really easy, as anyone who's tried to buy one off eBay to find without keyboards. So I ended up actually picking up a three pack of those terminals without keyboards. And that's sort of what prompted me to start this in the first place. Um, and I could use that same design with some minor adaptations pretty easily on uh, any of the systems pretty much that I have. And after that, my next step was because I could not find a replacement distributed server to build a replacement. This, there's a good chunk of documentation that I could find online. Um, BitSavers was a great tool. Dave Dunfield had, uh, has a bunch of disk images from Televideo stuff, including um, the software. So the server software is called Most, M-M-M-O-S-T. Uh, which stood for multi-user, multi-processing, something else, operating system technology. Um, which basically, machines could remotely boot over the RS-422 serial link. They could use that link to interact with um, both disk images and with actual file level calls get passed from CPM. So you could do shared file support, you could do record locking, um, basically anything you could use to do database support. Um, it did print sharing. Um, and a few things that let you interact to control, like printers, um, change between. So you had personalized directories on the system. So each user at their terminal would have the equivalent of a home directory, which is a mostly acted like a physical disk to that user. You could switch around between them with a, with a password. High security back in the days. Um, but some security is better than nothing, I guess. Let's see. So rev one of my board. This was a project I tried to get off the ground really quickly. So I started on this project in December of last year. And I had an overall goal that I wanted to get something I could present done by uh, VCF Pacific Northwest, which was in March. So I had about four months. Sounds like a great amount of time. Not at all. So this hardware, I had designed the board starting in December, had it made, had it assembled, and had it mostly talking to televideo systems by about Christmas time which was about when I, it was time to leave, <laughs> go on vacation for a couple weeks. Um, I didn't get it to do a whole lot at that point, but I got it to receive bytes from the machines so I could tell what 
they were trying to ask for, trying to do the bootstrap protocol. Um, finished a lot of that up in January pretty quickly, just sort of basic reverse engineering the protocol. Um, and moved on to a second design, which I started in January. Uh, so the first design was sort of monolithic. I had a board made up in a hurry. Um, I used a company called Advanced Circuits, which I had used um, in my computer engineering undergrad work. I, have dis I had discovered since then, China is way cheaper to make circuit boards. So the first board cost me like 90 bucks for one, per board. Um, I got two because two cost me about $10 more than one did. Um, these I got for 50 cents per PCB from, I think it was Seed Studio out of China. The board quality is not perfect. There's definitely deviations between my design of the boards and between boards, but everything worked just fine. Um, so I sort of moved. So the hardware I was using is, if anyone's heard of the next thing chip, let's see. Um, over on the left, there's a next thing chip. It's basically an ARM board. It was meant to be a, the world's first $9 computer. Had built-in flash storage, uh, single core, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, a bunch of GPIO. Um, sort of was what helped push uh, all of these other, other people like Raspberry Pi to make the zero that were cheaper versions. Um, so I, I have a whole bunch of those for various reasons. The company went out of business. I ended up buying a good chunk of their stock uh, from a guy in Hong Kong. Um, so that, that's basically what I'm using. It runs uh, Debian Linux, um, hosts the disk images, has enough RAM to do everything. It has Wi-Fi, so I can actually internet enable all of this, which ends up being sort of fun. Um, the next board is sort of a buffer board that goes between the GPIO pins, converts them to five volt logic, and talks to these next three boards on the right, which um, I can actually get. So they use the 85 C30s as the serial chip, which will talk RS-422. Um, 800 kilobaud, a um, couple of drivers on there, a couple of, so they use DA15 connectors so you can get the number of pins that they needed. And theoretically, I could have up to eight of those off of one board, but I really only do two. Um, I have a prepackaged sort of case version. If you stop by my booth, I can show you. So this is what I ended up using to try to connect things together. Um, the 801 required some repair, which I talked on earlier. So I ran into this f interesting fault where occasionally when I tried to run a program in CPM, the machine would reboot. Uh, I tracked this down to some incomplete address decoding and IO signal decoding on the board. So there's an, if there's an I.O. port to switch between banks of memory between the ROM and the RAM, and it only really checks a few of the signals. So if you're doing a read, and on the right part of the signal, there's, let's see. If you're doing, if there's an interrupt request and it has on the bus the value 6, um, which can happen depending on interrupt vector, just the way interrupts work on the Z80, um, it would reboot. So occasionally it would load the code, it would, change, it would change itself back to the ROM memory, it would get, it's run whatever and end up back rebooting. Um, eventually I found that you need also decode not just the IO request, but IO crest and write at the same time, which got you the, which it actually is done on the 802 systems, which is on the schematics that I had, which were almost, which were pretty close to the 801 schematic um, board, but a little bit of flywire and some cutting of traces to fix that. Um, once I got that a little bit work, more working, I was able to do some more troubleshooting. 
So at that point, I could actually boot CPM on the machines. Um, booting on the machines works basically the, the ROM, the machine sends a boot request out the serial port. Um, server responds with a one uh, record. So records in this are 128 bytes, same size as a CPM disk record, so a convenient size. Um, it sends a program that is the bootstrap that loads the rest of the OS, um, which is pretty similar how do you bootstrap just about anything. So not overly complicated. Um, let's see. So I ended up using the 803 I have to do more of the work too. The, the hardware design that was probably three year, two or three years after they released the 801, they had really solidified not screwing up the hardware design, um, except for the overheating problems, which were sort of long-term reliability. But the design was pretty solid at that point. Um, and that's what I ended up using to do most of my development work on. Um, the system's a lot more, it has extra serial ports, so I can actually hook like a printer up to it and have the 422 interface. Um, so one of the things that I needed to do with my 803 is not all of them came with the 422 serial card that I showed you way back when. I ended up finding schematics and design and I re-implemented it on a new board uh, using the same old parts, which is just the Z80 SIO chip uh, buffers. I added an actual uh, RS232 serial port to that using a nine, sort of 10 pin header that's compatible with PC serial ports. Um, and an as yet to be completed SD card interface. I discovered on the option connector there's actually extra address lines. So I used some of those, routed them to an Arduino. And the goal with that is to eventually have a SD interface that I can write a driver for for CPM to do that. So back to the bootloader. Um, getting that to work, I was able to actually find source code for one of the bootloaders. Um, digging around uh, bit savers, I found there was actually a slash bit slash televideo, which for the TPC1, the portable, they actually had source code for some of CPM. They had source code for one of the bootstraps so I was able to sort of use a lot of that to reverse engineer things. Um, the source code was really invaluable for figuring out what they were trying to do. Um, so there are different parts that did worked different ways for there are different kinds of drives. Um, so there's, there's private drives, which are sort of like your home directory, um, which interact using pretending like it's a just basic disk image, which is a completely different paradigm than how it interacts with shared files, um, which actually pass the CPM call and file keep, sort of keep track of file handles um, back to the server. Um, one of the problems that I discovered developing the software is timing issues were a big thing. Everything was written so that the timing of the server that they made would work, including some hard code delay loops in the client software. Um, so it would time out if it didn't, it would wait a certain amount of time before it respected a response, and if, and then it would have a timeout. If I didn't sort of hit the window, and the window varied based on machine, of course. Um, so if I didn't hit the window on all the machines, it, I couldn't send data and it would just give me errors. Um, the other problem I had using Linux, kernel preemption sucks, interrupts suck. Um, I'd have to send a block of 128 bytes of data and I would underrun that buffer consistently um, because the kernel would decide, oh, I want to do a timer interrupt or receive some data over the network. Um, so I ended up actually in my code, and so all this started up as user land code. I tried doing interacting with it, not writing a kernel driver, 
Um, just using a GPIO pins directly. Didn't work particularly well. Um, I was able to do enough to get the bootstrap through sometimes. Um, going forward with this, I, need, I ended up writing a kernel driver, which I ended up actually rewriting um, once. I ended up having this, to- This, 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 Very good. <laughs> Uh, so I ended up having to uh, add some delays. I had to put actual sleeps in the kernel driver. Be careful doing that. Um, tried to make sure that I had timeouts which were reasonable um, so that it wouldn't get stuck in the driver. Disable preemption and interrupts. It's a whole lot of fun. So it actually has, has to send that block of 128 bytes to 800 kilobaud. Um, once I got that going, I started writing the replacement server. So I decided to call this almost, sort of as, as a homage to most, but it's not quite there, it's almost there. And at least one person's <laughs> laughing, so that's good. <laughs> um, so I tried, tried to make that very modular. I start out with um, sort of the basic routines, First thing I needed was to be able to send the bootstrap out, send the OS out, got those done. And then private drives were really easy to do. It's just an image. I just receive a request for some chunk of the file or to write a chunk of the file, take care of that. Um, then moved on from there to the shared file support. Um, there's a few, few interesting catches with that. I didn't discover right away until I tried using a few different programs that there is a limit to the number of file handles that the client would keep track of, which was like 10 or 12. Once you got past that number, it would start sending zero as the file handle, which the server had to figure out, oh, that's not the wrong file that you're trying to talk to. That's, you just ran out of file handles and I should still work. So I was returning an error and like that the file name doesn't match what you're, tell what you're telling me you want to talk to. Um, and then I got to the exciting parts, which were actual internet access. So with the shared file support, I could actually integrate some, so, some things with that to, first, first things I did were very simple, very, Important things to get files on and off the system. I implemented a special file that you could read from, which would read something from the host file system. If you wrote to another file, I'll write to the host file system. So at that point, I could actually get programs on and off the system. So I could write ZAD assembly on my laptop with a nice keyboard, with a nice editor that um, had nice tools for compiling and debugging. Uh, disassembling some of the software. Um, from there, I moved on to something that would start to integrate with, if you've heard of libcurl, it's a library that lets you basically do any HTTP or other sort of request. There's FTP, there's SFTP. Um, so pull and get requests to internet sites. Started with just something to pull down an HTTP URL, display the text. Um, realized I need to do end of line conversions, of course. Um, figured out pagination was a very good thing to add. So I added pagination, end of line, so I just wouldn't get a thousand characters that I couldn't interrupt going to the system console. Um, and then from that, I went on to some tests of trying to work with the image system. So the 803 and TPC1 have some, abil some ability to do the graphics, which I talked about, which are all in a separate bank of memory. And for the most part, you can talk to, the OS resides in both banks of memory, at the top of memory. And there's also another couple, one or two kilobytes of memory that I could fit a subroutine into. So I had to, and every time I used the OS, to make it more difficult, it would make sure I was back in bank zero, 
getting the data. So I couldn't just switch to the graphics bank, say, hey, give me some data and write it to the video memory. Actually, I had to write it to system memory, copy it from using the program into video memory. Um, the program started up. I had to use relocatable code so that I could copy, take, take the subroutine that interacted with graphics, copy into high memory so it wouldn't get swapped out. Um, so I could, the program basically ended up being read memory, read, read the data from the serial line, receive the file, uh, a chunk at a time, so 128 bytes. It's the only size I could read. Um, I had to figure out how to make that work with the video. Um, copy that chunk into higher memory uh, with subroutine. Use a subroutine to copy it into video memory after switching banks. Jump back and repeat. Um, to make all this harder, I hear this is sort of like maybe Hercules mode. It used a four-way interlacing. So uh, the video memory was set up so the first in four banks, the first bank had lines 0, 4, 8, 12. The next bank had 1, 5, etc. cetera. Um, so I also had to de-inter, I had to completely figure out how to reverse engineer how to, with no documentation, how to lay out the images in memory. Um, and if you want an example of that, I have an example running at my booth all the way at the back of room D and the end next to the big uh, Nortel Meridian 1 phone switch. Um, it's probably displaying something right now, but if you stop by when I'm actually there, I can show you. I can make it display any image off the internet, which as long as I can type the URL into a prompt, which mostly works. Um, so all of my code that I've done, I have applied the GPL to. It is available on GitHub. Um, the keyboard converter source code is included. Um, the PS2 keyboard library is fortunately LGPL, so I could, so that's I can make all that available. Um, almost is available, including the kernel driver. Um, I haven't modified the clients at all. Um, the clients you can download as they are copyrighted by Televideo from various archive sites like Dave Dunfield's. So things that I've learned doing this project. Oh, I've learned a lot. China makes okay PCBs. Um, they're really cheap. They end up being 50 cents a PCB if you order 10 of them. I, the only reason that I can find to use a vendor in the US is because you want to use a vendor in the US, which is nothing wrong with that, or if you have some sort of requirements like ITAR that require you to. Um, PCB design is not impossible. I used um, Eagle, which I was able to fortunately get for free in the full version using with an academic license. I work for Purdue University, so that was lucky. Um, I started to look at KiCad a little bit. The biggest reason I've stuck with Eagle is I've, you end up needing to make a lot of parts for old machines because these are all geared up towards making new, new stuff. No one really has the ADSIO chips in their library. Um, make it easy. So I ended up having to do a bunch of that myself. Um, I also learned that if I go back here, you'll notice that I used a bunch of surface mount chips. And that's not because I hate hobbyists, but because I have discovered once you do it three or four times, surface mount is way easier to solder, um, assuming you have halfway decent tools. It takes minutes to solder a 40 pin dip and the amount of <laughs> smoke that I breathe in is <laughs> sort of annoying. Um, on surface mount chips, you just throw a bunch of flux on the board, sort of tack, tack the corners of the chip on, then just rake the solder down it, and I mean, it, it's so much easier and faster. It, I'd love to see hobbyists do more surface mount. Um, 
Disassembling Z80 code wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, a good chunk of this, and I did have to disassemble some amount of bootloaders, um, system ROMs just to figure out what was going on. And it wasn't too bad. I started out as a complete novice a year ago. Um, it's, it's been challenging to write with a limited number of registers and no multiply and divide. I've got to learn how to shift things around to sort of do fixed multiplication in code. Um, tools Z80 DSM, DASM, and Z80 ASM on Linux, or other, I'm sure they're available on other systems, are open source, great tools. Um, they have some bugs, but once you figure them out, it's pretty easy to work around. The old code was full of race conditions. Um, there are all sorts of points where if I didn't meet the timing requirements, if I was too fast or too slow, responding, it just, I, nothing worked. <laughs> um, I did find out when I started, I, if I slowed down the baud rate by one step, which was ended up being 666 kilobaud, perfect number, of course, um, things worked with my user mode code. It was just slow enough I could avoid, occasionally avoid the kernel jump, jumping on me um, but anything slower than that and everything. And the system would just time out waiting for the message to come across. For some reason, the Z85 C30, the CMOS version, works, and the Z85 30, the NMOS original version, would give me transmit buffer errors. Um, I never quite worked that one out, but I ended up deciding just to use spend a couple extra bucks per chip. Chips are pretty cheaply available, actually even new. Um, most of the Z80 chips, thanks to everyone who used them in embedded systems, are still pretty widely available. Um, yep, bank switching. I hate bank switching, but it's necessary evil. Um, I never thought I'd be writing position-independent code on a Z80. But, and self-modifying code. Um, CPM BIOS, I got to learn a whole bunch about the internals of CPM. Um, I had never programmed on CPM before. I had used DOS back when I was growing up. But CPM, assembly language programming, actually not terrible. Not great, the biggest problem I had with it is just the amount, sheer volume of instructions I had to write to do a simple task. And the 16-bit systems bring new challenges. I'm still working on, so I finally got the holy grail, it seems like, the 1603, which is the 16-bit version of the 803 that runs CPM. Um, I finally broke down, paid the guy who had one listed on eBay way more money than I'm willing to admit. But now I have one, now I have something that I can work on as a future project, try to get that working. Um, the segmented architecture that they use in 16-bit CPM adds complications that I haven't quite figured out how to work around yet. So if you would like to find more information, I have a GitHub there. I will be over at my booth, um, the back of room D next to the phone switch. And thank you all for coming.